we are now in Newcastle and we have a guest from Newcastle, Professor Sugata, Sugata Mitra, born in India, uh, worked here as a professor of the University of Newcastle in the School of Education, Communication and Language Sciences. And he is, of course, world famous about his projects of the hole in the wall and his uh, very, uh, you can say, extreme revolutionary thoughts about learning and education. And as one of the thinkers who will say that our system of education is obsolete. Seeing your expertise, your experience, and all your uh, can say compassion for learning or humanity worldwide, what would be your European dream? If I, if I take that as what is my wish for Europe, then I would say that in the near, near term future, the very near term future, um, it looks as though Europe will get wealthier. All the, all the signs seem to indicate that it will get wealthier. It's doing many things quite right. If I take the slightly further view, if I take 20, 30 years up ahead, then I think Europe will enter into an era which is more confused. And this confusion will, I think, arise from the nature of society. So it won't just be Europe, it will be the whole world uh, confronted with the collective as opposed to the individual. We already are in it, but there will be more and more of it. By 20 or 30 years, uh, it, it would be all encompassing. Um, so that w would be in the, in the 30 year time frame. If, just for the heck of it, if we had to look at Europe a couple of hundred years ahead. Well, we can safely say that 200 years from now will be as different from today as 200 years ago was. So we subtract 200 years from 2019 and we get 1819. So I can safely say that uh, what was in 1819 uh, would be as different from today as 200 years from now, 2219, which actually takes care of almost everything we have right now, <laughs> from our clothing to our transportation, to our thinking, to our education, to our, the way we do business. Uh, all of it necessarily has to be different. Okay. You said anyway, in the, in the short term, Europe will be wealthier because they do a lot of things good. Maybe we can talk about what you mean by that. They do a lot of things good. And then you said in, the f in 30 years from now, we will be even in a stronger uh, contradiction or development from the individual to the collective. Huh? So let's first start with uh, your remark, they're doing things good. So that's why they become wealthier. Can you uh, elaborate on that? That is in the context of today. In the context of today for nations, doing good is usually synonymous with becoming richer. You know, it's, uh, it's hard for a nation to say we will do uh, good things um, and as a result we will become poorer. Uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. So, so I, I, I tend to take, uh, take it for granted that good somehow is associated with wealth, at least as far as nations are concerned. Unfortunately, that's also true as far as many individuals are concerned. Mm -hmm. But let's leave that out of the discussion. Uh, so, what is the good that Europe is doing? I think it's, it's looking at trade in a, in a rational way. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is looking at uh, what the world needs now and what the world is likely to need in the future. And uh, it is trying to prepare for both. So, that would be the extent to which I would say that it is making moves that are good and therefore will result in a wealthier Europe. So you say, very important, good means normally in nations wealthier, 
which also we can go deeper in that, of course. Uh, but mostly uh, doing good is doing things in a rational way, and Europe has done things in a rational way. And you say they are also asking, what do the world, what does the world need now? And what does the world need in the future? So that's also a rational way of becoming wealthy. Can you elaborate on that? Um, you know, first uh, of all, I need to say that Europe uh, doesn't actually mean very much to me. Now, I, I, I know that that sounds terrible, but let me put it this way. India also doesn't sound very much to me, doesn't make much sense to me. Example, what is Indian food? Okay, now everybody knows what Indian food is. Kormas and tikkas and tandoori. Um, I know as an Indian that that is not correct. That is not Indian food. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is food from one place in India. Yeah. <laughs> so, if I, if I then translate that to the European analogy and, and ask you, uh, what is European food? And, uh, and you were to say, uh, goat's heads, because they eat it in Greece. It's quite tasty. But I think that many other Europeans will say, no, this is not European food. <laughs> we, have, we also eat all sorts of other things. So, uh, so, so first of all, in, in relation to your question about Europe, uh, in my mind, I, I see the map of Europe and I say, and I think to myself, what, what is, what does he mean? To which part? Where? Mm -hmm. Uh, who is doing what? Well, let's go from east to west. On the eastern edges are the new bits of Europe. Well, the new as in new entrance to the EU uh, as perceived by, by most people. I guess culturally they already always have been a part of Europe, but they're newer, they're poorer. Uh, their cultural influences come uh, not as much from Greece and perhaps France, Germany, England as it does also from Russia, India, China. Yeah. So that's the eastern side of Europe. What are they doing good? Well, they seem to be gearing up. They, they're looking cleaner. Um, from what little I have seen, they, they're definitely looking cleaner. Uh, they uh, are, are making changes to governance, which only small countries can afford to do. And I, I love it. They, they, they have, you know, bold prime ministers and presidents who take, you know, major steps. I hope they will succeed. Okay, let's move further towards the West. And now we will enter into the heartland. Um, let, let me imagine the map. So, there's, you've got Germany there, you've got the Netherlands and Belgium and, uh, and down there you've got a large part of Spain. Spain's very big. Um, and you've got… Uh, France. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm taking France as the West, the okay, last, yeah. last bit. So, uh, if I take that swath of Europe, uh, Italy, uh -huh. Greece, the first thing to notice is that uh, there is an enormous amount of disparity. What you can earn for babysitting for one hour in Greece is very different from what you would earn for the same George activity Trump. in Germany. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think Europe will need to address that issue at some stage and perhaps they are. They are already doing that through different ways of taxation, different kinds of rules and, and, and uh, so on. And then we look at the West and we have mostly uh, well, Spain, Portugal, France uh, occupy a large part of the Western side of uh, Europe. Ireland, um, uh, I, I don't know, I was about to say Iceland. 
but, but you, you know, I mean, there's that piece. I don't quite understand that bit, <laughs> but, but there's Western Europe. And uh, they seem actually a little more confused than the middle bit. Yeah. The middle bit at least knows what the problems are and are trying to address it. The far west of uh, Europe are in two conditions. On the one hand, sad that things are not going well. And on the other hand, quite convinced that they indeed are the very best the world has ever seen. So caught between these two, <laughs> they, they, they struggle with, with reform. Uh, but why am I addressing it this way is because I can't answer a question like, where, what's your dream for Europe? You could ask me what's what's your what's your dream for France, and I might be able to work out something, <laughs> but not for the whole of Europe. So, but let's look at it in these three bits, yeah. and uh, I think we will get uh, some answers. Uh, just to revisit the three bits: the eastern side, uh, new, young, uh, moving up. I think the middle bit, the the, the traditional heartland of Europe always very rational, uh, perhaps a little more polite than they need to be. Uh, but perhaps they won't let that politeness hold them back. And perhaps they will be able to equalize the big differences that they have within them. And then the far west, I hope they will stop being confused about the past and the present. Um, it's easy to get confused about the past and the present in, in those countries who are on the far west of, mm -hmm. of Europe. If they do not get confused, then I think that they could also join in with the middle bit. And uh, maybe one day we will have a unified European civilization. Okay. Now we can talk about that unified <laughs> European civilization. After repeating your uh, statement, it's like, okay, Europe did well, but then you said it's also difficult to talk about Europe because if you talk about India and everybody say, well, it's a ta uh, uh, tandoori food, it's not India because it's just a small region of India. And if you talk uh, Europe, you can say a goat's head or pig's feet in, in <laughs> Spain did not accept it in the Dutch. So what is Europe? So then you made a proposal to split into the the Far East, the Middle and the Far West and the East are new and have a lot of influence from Russia, India, China, not so much from the Mediterranean, like Athens. Then we have the Middle, which is a very rational part, with great disparity, but with an awareness of we should solve these problems. And mostly they succeeded. And in the Far West is, is also France, but also Britain and Ireland, and they are uh, sad because they think they are not reaching what they're promised, but they're also very strong that they are the best. So that's a sort of psychological problem. And then you said, maybe let's look, we have maybe in the future, we come to a unified European civilization. Can you elaborate on that <laughs> uh, unified <laughs> European civilization? Well, <laughs> I... You know, I, I uh, really shouldn't be saying this, but I uh, I couldn't help thinking of a uh, uh, a question that was asked in the 1940s to Gandhi. Uh, I think it was asked in London, and the question was, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And uh, Gandhi had uh, answered, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I'm not saying I agree with him. Okay, <laughs> uh, it's just that this uh, this, this pops up. Yeah, this, this line came into my mind. So I think, <laughs> uh, what do I mean by European civilization? Well, as as a, person, a unified uh, European a civilization. unified European civilization. Yeah, well, as a person, nice, nice uh, concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a person who uh, has spent most of his life outside of that, that region, first of all, uh, I have tremendous admiration, mm -hmm. as do, I think, most people on the planet. 
tremendous admiration for the culture, the thinking, the philosophy and the achievements of what is described as Europe. I, I have to keep on saying what is described as Europe for the reasons that I mentioned yes. earlier. But for that region of the earth, a, a, a great deal of respect, a great deal of admiration. Uh, that part of the world created much of the world as it is today. It did so using two methods. One was science and technology. The other was colonialism. I would hope that Europe would one day realize that these are two very different things. Um, I hope that the European will take pride in the fact that they created a world using their thought, their inventions and their science. And at the same time, I hope that they will not take pride in what colonialism did to the rest of the world. If they could do both, then perhaps they could take the right step forward. Okay. Europe have made the world as it is, basically, a destinate world as it is, by two methods, by science and technology and by colonialism and um, Europe can proceed when it does two things. First, being pride on their inventions, their technology, their science, how they improved and designed the world and not taking pride in everything that's connected with colonialism. They have to do these two things, it's your uh, thought now. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, perhaps I should start with the second bit first, because that, you know, is the, the touchy bit that this whole issue of colonialism and not taking pride in colonialism, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, for a moment, let's say, what does taking pride in colonialism mean? Let's mm. take the opposite. That's easier. <laughs> You'd say, you could say, Europe, I'm not going to name parts of Europe. Now, we will use Europe as the umbrella term. Europe brought the railway to the world. Um, it changed the whole world. It, it globalized the world. It, it did a whole lot of things. It was the literally the engine of the Industrial Revolution. The railways and the associated inventions. So, should Europe take pride in that? I think it should take pride in the fact that it invented the engine of the Industrial Revolution and the associated science, particularly the science of thermodynamics, which altered our entire view of the universe, not just the world. Of course, you should take a great pride in such understanding. But, to take railways into countries is perhaps not such an enormous uh, sense of pride associated with it. Um, it's perhaps uh, the right way would have been to say we took the railways into many parts of the world and maybe we should have done it differently. Uh, Europe invented the railway and it is connected to the, uh, so the engine of the Industrial Revolution. It's connected to the basics of thermodynamics. You can be pride, have pride on that. But to bring railways in all kinds of the world, maybe that's not so connected to pride. And maybe you should say, maybe we should have done it differently. 
as an example of not taking pride in colonialism. Can you elaborate on that? Let's look for a minute at culture. Mm -hmm. Move away from science to culture. Uh, among the first things that Europeans noticed, and particularly the Germans did, was the fact that their language had come from the East. It is a sense of great pride to me as an Indian, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope it is, a, it is a matter of great pride to Germans to have actually unearthed that fact, Sanskrit, yeah. and, the, and what got to be called the Indo-European languages. languages. Uh, having, having discovered that, what the Germans did was to try and understand the basic literature of the Sanskrit world. And I think they were enriched by it. Uh, you know, people like uh, Max Müller, for example. Uh, they are legends in India, by the way. <laughs> Because I think as Indians, we know that we would have not known as much about ourselves, mm. except for people like that. That to me is the, is the, is the face of Europe that I would like to see. Mm. Did it make Germany poorer? I don't think so. <laughs> so, so they could do it again. Okay. Um, they did the same or similar things. The heartland of Europe did similar things with the culture of Greece. That, of course, we all know. We use uh, any student of physics knows the entire Greek alphabet because of that. Um, that's the good bit. We are proud of the achievements of the Greeks. We are proud that the basis of our thinking, of our art, of our architecture, all came out of Greece. Perhaps Europe should feel not so proud about how Greece is today. As opposed to saying it's all their fault. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> You know, okay. I, I, I would say, so, so when you look at these old cultures from which, much of which Europe unearthed and used and admired, this is the good bit. The poor bit is of not looking back at them after all this is done, to look at where it came from and to say, uh, what can we do for them? apart from bringing in the railways. So, um, we go now for uh, the same question, what is the pride in colonialism and the not having pride in colonialism, or not having pride in colonialism and yes, pride in science. And then you go to culture, and then we can see that Europeans, for instance, have, and the Germans were they're very conscious of, have the origin of the language from the East, and that's why we call it the Indo-European language families, and especially the study of Sanskrit from people like Max Buller has uh, enriched the German culture and also, strangely enough, the Indian uh, awareness of their own language. So here we see a sort of pride in this European science, and that could be done again by the Germans instead of uh, having this uh, colonialism uh, treatment. And another example you gave about Greece, Greece is of course the origin of basically all our language, our physics, our philosophy, but people are treating Greece not as the valuable treasure that it once used to be. So it could be for Europe a good thing to acknowledge the value of these old cultures and revalue them, what can we do for them, is what you said. So this is all part of a unified European civilization, which is also connected with other civilizations in the world. So, 
can we go back for this European unified European civilization to what you think is essential if we think about learning and personal growth? That's your where your expertise lies in. What is the dream in this unified European civilization if we talk about learning? Um, I the first time I ever went outside India was to Vienna, Austria. I went there as a postdoctoral fellow uh, to develop uh, newer and more energy density batteries of all things. I was at the Technische Universität in Vienna for about a year or so working on this. However, I was surrounded by Vienna. My father was a um, Freudian psychoanalyst. In Vienna, I used to live on a street called Türkenstrasse, which was uh, right next to or parallel to another street called Wassergasse. Wasagase is, as far as I remember, where Sigmund Freud lived. Among the first things I did in Vienna was to go to Freud's house. And I used to think to myself, what made this man think the way he did? And I remember conversations in our living room way back when I was maybe 12 years old with my father and his colleagues chatting about something similar. And somebody jokingly said, the greatest psychoanalyst on the planet could only have come from a society where he was surrounded by mad people. So I began to look at the Viennese. <laughs> Did they produce Freud? <laughs> so, uh, and then when you read uh, Vienna's history and you read about Freud's own writings about his patients and so on, you realize that, well, uh, it was a highly repressed society that he was in. He discovered the word repression. Well, that's eminently logical, isn't it? That you would discover repression if you were surrounded by repression and repressed behavior. So, I got more and more interested in that year in Vienna, uh, not so much in my zinc chlorine batteries, which I actually managed to publish a paper on, but I got more and more interested about the mind of Sigmund Freud and his great associate, uh, Carl Jung. Yeah. Next to Wasagase, was another parallel street. It's called Boltzmann Gasse. And of course, any physicist would know why it's called Boltzmann Gasse, because Boltzmann, the great statistical physicist, the father of statistical physics, lived there. I went to Boltzmann's house. See, who is this man who thought of using statistics to describe mechanics of physical systems. It must have been so weird in its time. It must have sounded like, you know, mumbo jumbo. It must have, to other physicists. Who was this man? Next lane to Sigmund Freud's house was Boltzmann. I went to Boltzmann's study. I looked in awe at Boltzmann's desk. And there was an old Austrian housekeeper. And uh, she, she said, are you a physicist? I said, yes, I am a physicist. And she said to me in German, do you see the big window there next to his table? I said, yes, it's a big window from almost from floor to ceiling. And she said, he jumped from there. I said, oh, so Boltzmann fell on Boltzmann Gasse. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vienna. Yeah. 
uh, I feel I was deeply affected by, by this learning. Out of, out of the way thinking. The study of repression, the study of how the mind works, the statistics of how particles move. Is there a common thread? I had no answer at that time. This was 1981, 80, 81. Mm -hmm. I had no answer to it. I barely understood what a computer was. I had used one in my, in my PhD. I knew how to program one. I was a very good programmer, but I never used to think about computers until 10 years or 15 years later, the computers started to get connected with each other. And then suddenly computers were not entirely predictable anymore. And programs would have bugs in them that were incredibly difficult to track down because one bug was affecting the other bug in another program and another program and another program. And in the middle of that, in the mid 1990s, I thought of Boltzmann, and I thought of Freud. And I thought, does it have something to do with being connected? Jump forward five more years, the hole in the wall experiment. I had no idea why I was doing it. I had no idea what the results would be. I just wanted to see what children would do if they were confronted with a computer. In 1999 in India, there were many children who didn't know what a computer was, who didn't know what the internet was, anything. What would they do if they were confronted with it? Well, the answer, they would learn how to use it by themselves. Very non-intuitive in 1999, not at all non-intuitive today. The unanswered question, who was teaching them, remained. And in my mind, I hope in my subconscious mind, were sitting Freud, Jung and Boltzmann. I went from there to more experiments, to more experiments, got the same results over and over again. I didn't know how to publish in social science. I used to use the methods of physics. People used to call me naive. Uh, <laughs> uh, physicists used to abandon me saying, what you on earth have you very much gone? <laughs> and uh, then in 2006, uh, I, I came to England. In England, I repeated some of these experiments, this time in a classroom. Because in England, you can't do an outdoor hole in the wall experiment. We were talking about Europe, you know, in most places in Europe, you cannot do the hole in the wall experiment no. because all the children would freeze to death. And they are not allowed. <laughs> and you're not allowed and there, there will be a thousand rules. So, but anyway, uh, I did those experiments inside classrooms. One of the first experiments that I remember, well, not experiment actually, I was working with year four in a city called Gateshead where I live now, uh, in a tiny school. And they were wonderful, those nine-year-olds, you know, I just love them. So they were all friends of mine and they, one day they were queuing up to go home. Okay, 3.30 or 4 or whatever, so they make a line. Their parents come or the school bus comes and they go off to this line. I was there and uh, so was their teacher. So I asked the children, shall we do one last experiment? The children used to love these experiments, okay? They would keep asking me, so what are the results that you've got from your previous experiment and so on? So they said, yes, yes, we want to do one last experiment. And their teacher said, oh, hold on, they've got only five minutes. I said, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so I told the first child, you face the door. The next child who was standing behind him, I said, now you turn around and face the other way. And the third one, I said, face the door. The fourth one, the other way. So now I had this line of children Every alternate child was either facing back or facing forward. 
And then I, when that was done, then I said, okay, now tell me, is this one line or is it not? And they said, no, it's one line, we're all in line. No, we're in two lines. There's one line facing that way, one line facing this way. And by now the teacher is saying, it's time, it's time, it's time for them to go. But before they left, I got what I wanted. A single voice from a little girl who said, Sugata, there are two lines in the same place together. Okay. And said, so this, is, this is not Boltzmann. This is Heisenberg. <laughs> It's there and it's not there at the same time. <laughs> Both things are there at the same time. So nine year olds, how is it possible? It can only be possible if an absurd assumption were to be true. If the knowledge already existed inside the child. And the two line experiments simply got it out. Children can reproduce a concept like uh, basically Boltzmann, Freud, over, even better than that, go into Heisenberg or Max Muller or even uh, Hegel, I would suggest. Uh, so what is uh, you, uh, your hinting basically at saying knowledge doesn't, is not something outside us, we are learning what is inside us. Can so, you Yes, uh, so far so good. I started looking at all the really old cultures yeah. and found a, a rather strange, uh, strange set of facts that the older a civilization is, the more they tend towards saying that knowledge is not external but is internal. From Mexico to China, from Egypt to India, the civilizations that are more than 5,000 years old all seem to have come to this kind of a conclusion. Why? Why would they come to this conclusion? Were these cultures only based on philosophical musings and drugs and what we popularly believe. But that can't be true either. They used to build pyramids. They had astronomical measurement instruments. The Chinese invented just about everything. So they knew their science. They knew their technology. Why on earth did they come to this conclusion that knowledge is not external? Around this time, the internet had grown to enormous proportions, a billion people. I started asking my question, uh, asking my students and conference audiences a very simple question. Does the internet exist? And of course, everybody was, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they thought it was a trick question. This, of course, uh, we use it 24 by 7. So I said, yes, uh, it exists, of course. Next question. Where is it? And I would invariably get an un, get a silence. You know, oh, where? And I realized that networks don't have a physical existence. They exist, but they don't exist in physical space. So, what does that mean? They are not external. That much we can say. The internet is not external. You mean to say it's inside my head? No, I'm not saying that. It exists, but it doesn't exist in space. So asking a question, where is it? The question is not right. That to me seemed to have a tremendous bearing on learning. Because learning is all about asking questions. Where is it? What is it? What happens if the questions go wrong? What if, what if the question itself is not right? You could say, where is my watch? It's grammatically correct and it has a meaning. 
but you could not say where is time. That's also grammatically correct, but it doesn't have any meaning. It's the wrong question. I began to think of how many such wrong questions we have inside our education and learning systems. And because the only company I had in those years were mostly children, I asked children. And I found that they were tremendously interested in such questions. They were tremendously interested in searching for the answers, if we can give them the right environment. In Gates said, in that little town, we created the self-organized learning environment, the soul, as it's called, S-O-L-E. And souls began to spread all through Britain, then all through Australia of all places, all through Latin America. And I must say, last Europe, <laughs> and the very last, the United States. Why? I still don't know. And sometimes I feel I should not even ask. I think it is the, I think it could be the weighing down uh, by uh, rational history. That's not the way to do things. Self-organization is not the way to do things. We need to be told what to do. Okay. I began to move away from that supposition somewhere around 2012. On 20, in 2012, they got me onto the stage in Oxford to give a TED talk. And I first expressed this feeling that the network, which doesn't have a physical existence, is perhaps the key to understanding how learning emerges. Perhaps self-organization is the mechanism. Perhaps spontaneous order is what we should be looking for. The audience, to my, to my great amazement and to my great pleasure, responded spontaneously, <laughs> responded vigorously, responded to an extent that I ended up getting a million dollar prize in 2013. <laughs> you know, I said, what for? Self-organization. It's almost as though something in the human psyche had woken up to what had been buried of all things by our greatest achievement, the Industrial Revolution. The realization that people are not machines and therefore people should not be trained like machines. Uh, it was perhaps the right time. I, I like to say that if I hadn't given the 2012 TED talk, somebody else would have. It was just the right time for self-organization to, to emerge. Who will understand self-organization if it is going to be the learning mechanisms for the future? Who will understand it? Well, the older cultures, for sure, I hope. But then they never do anything with their understanding. Who will do something with the understanding? And you asked me right in the beginning, what is my dream? Well, may I be bold enough to say that the person who puts the self-organized, spontaneous learning environment into education should perhaps be somewhere in the vicinity of Boltzmann Gassi. <laughs> I'll wait for okay. him or her. You discovered, basically, that learning is a... Uh, that's taking place in a good, organ good environment and that this learning in a good environment um, was also related that you realize that knowledge is not external, like in 
our Western uh, philosophy of education and that we have to think about this different way. But you experience in your, in your gate set here that working with children gave you a lot of insight in how it works. And what is then, the, the question is then, how is it that old cultures knew that already? Because they had a lot of collective learning, like in Mexico or in China or in India, or whatever, in Persia. And uh, here it's completely disappeared. And then the assume, you assume that it is the rational uh, process of working. And it's also, of course, the whole essence of the industrial revolution that is making machines and then teaching kids to become a machine. And we should not make human beings becoming machines. So that is an interesting challenge for a unified European civilization, which comes to a sort of end, coming from an individual stance, going to a collective stance. And there you say, that here is an interesting hope because the older cultures don't are not so active maybe they are too happy or maybe are, they just like every day to do the same or whatever reason but the older culture don't do nothing with their experience and their assets maybe something around this Boltzmann Gasse must arise and that is your dream of a unified European civilization I hope it is the next step that Europe takes, okay. Europe, I say specifically. Why do I say it's the next step that Europe takes? Because it's a step that's been taken before by the older cultures. I don't know where they took it to, but the point is they survived for 5,000 years. Yeah. Okay. So that's not bad. They, I think they did a good job before they <laughs> began to disintegrate. <laughs> 5,000 years is a long time. 5,000 years will take us to um, 3,000 uh, the year, More, yeah. uh, year one or whatever. So, if the realization shifts to the collective as being inclusive and not based on dualism of the external and the internal, in a network, whatever exists, exists in the network and out of it at the same time. Yeah. It's a hard concept to get today because we all come from our mechanistic backgrounds, but it won't be in the future. For the generation to come, they will, I think, understand it clearly. And it will be because of the internet. The internet will play a big part in this understanding. I don't think that we understand very well that the internet is also capable of demonstrating spontaneous order. We don't understand it because that spontaneous order is not human. The internet may be made up of humans, but the spontaneous order that it produces is not human. Just as the billions of neurons that make up our brains don't know that they are conscious. No. But what comes out is, is spontaneous consciousness. Okay, so um, you said basically it is interesting that Europe takes this next step because all the cultures already have done that and they took 5,000 years before this. So that gives us an extra 3,000 years. <laughs> and in this next step, the realization will be in the collective, will be out of the dualism of internal and external, and will be more in this girl saying there are two lines and one line, and there is the, the cat is dead and not cat like in quantum. So it's this internal and external at the same time which is a, a very interesting challenge you gave us in this uh, talk. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me.